Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on responsibilities, risks and rewards of directorship. My name is Claire Braun. I'm the Executive Director and Founder of Women on Boards, and we are delighted to be partnering with Redback Conferencing and Governance Institute of Australia in bringing you this morning's discussion. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge country, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and in fact, elders past and present across this nation of ours, who for many tens of thousands of years have demonstrated leadership and, and governance. And really, it's on those skills that we build today. We've got an excellent panel, all Women on Boards members, and a number of them from Governance Institute. And I'd like to turn to them now to introduce themselves to you. First of all, Leah Fricke. Thank you, Claire. My name's Leah Fricke. I've been a non-executive director for around three years in the commercial space and for at least 15 years prior to that on not-for-profit boards. I was a lawyer and company secretary in my professional career. My final executive role was a GM role looking after a range of operational areas in financial services. I've been very fortunate to work on a number of Indigenous corporation boards, so I echo my acknowledgement of the elders past and present across the nation. And I currently work in a range of areas including medical technology and financial services. Thank you very much, Leah. And to Janet Tawney. Thanks, Claire. I've been a non-executive director on a professional basis for about three years. The areas that I've covered are very much in the financial services, not-for-profit and to some extent in the engineering area. I'm currently chairman of Whitehelm Capital, which is a global infrastructure investment management business and an advisory business, serving on a range of their committees and also chairing their investment committee. Recently been appointed to a credit union board, and I'm also on the board of Girl Guides Australia, um, something right to my heart. I grew up through the guiding movement, and that's one of the good things about boards, um, that you actually come back to your roots very often. As well as that, I'm on a, a range of advisory boards, Australian Cycling Executives, which is a professional networking group for senior executives, professional IT and investment um, areas, also involved with ASFA, which is the Association of um, Superannuation Funds of Australia. With a different hat on, I have executive director roles in two smaller consulting businesses, one for professional services and one in the engineering and manufacturing sector. My experience in these professional roles has been built over the last 25 years in terms of directorships, both in my executive career in not-for-profit, um, community-based organisations, industry-based associations. So overall, it's with a joy that you move into the non-executive director space, um, and that's something we're going to discuss later today. Thanks very much, Janet. It is indeed. Tricia. Good morning, Claire, and good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Tricia Mock, and I'm the current president and chair of Governance Institute of Australia. Uh, my journey with Governance Institute began when I was a student in 2004, 2006, and did the Graduate Diploma of Applied Corporate Governance, then joined the council, and then became representative director on the board. I became vice president two years ago, and was appointed president this year. As president, I'm the chair of the board. I recently chaired the board meeting on the 8th of May and the AGM as well in Adelaide. And in terms of strategy, a uh, key focus for me is raising awareness of the name change from Chartered Secretaries Australia to Governance Institute. I'm also passionate about women in governance and events like today and women on boards is very important to me. Um, finally, I'd like to be known as the digital president. I'm trying to move Governance Institute into the digital age and um, like my co-panellist Leah Fricke, I'm quite active on Twitter and if anybody's online at the moment, please, please feel free to tweet about the panel today. Thank you. Thank you very much. A great point and a number of you might be on the Women on Boards Twitter stream as well, which of course is Women on Boards. So please feel free to tweet because you'll be sharing all of the knowledge. In fact, there are 700 of you uh, at last count, there could be more out there listening to this, so our thanks again for registering for today's conversation. Okay, we're going to kick off. You've all submitted some questions, some areas that you want um, the panel to discuss. 
A number of you are looking really at the first boards or looking at why you'd want to be a company director. Um, so really, are the risks that great? What are the rewards? And more importantly, what are the responsibilities? I'm going to ask Janet first off what the role of a non-executive director is and are there any really key skill sets that you think that directors need? Claire, one of the key things as a non-exec director is to be part of a team. People may be not the first thing that people think about, but as a non-executive director, mm. you're sitting around a board, a table. It is the board's responsibility to oversee the business, provide guidance, set strategy, make sure that you're complying with all the various risks um, and uh, regulations. But importantly, you're part of that team. In an ideal world, you've actually got a skill set that combines with the others around that board to be able to provide the oversight. You then come to, you talked about core skill sets. There's probably two things that you absolutely have to have. You have to understand directors' duties and responsibilities, mm -hmm. and you actually need to be understand the financials mm -hmm. of the business. Um, they're things you can't come away, away from. I think we might have some discussion later. They've both been tested very interestingly in some legal cases. It is a collective as a board, but you as individuals need to be able to take responsibility for those. The other key skill sets that you're looking for is understanding your business, or understanding the company you're with, and then probably having a specialist skill around that mm. board so that you can then, as a collective, make sure that you can deliver in terms of the oversight of the business, and I think we'll come to later again in terms of exec versus board, but making sure you're not doing the work of the business, but you're providing that oversight, guidance and sounding board. Mm -hmm. Leah, would you echo those? Yeah, I think Janet's covered off the key ones and I think that collaboration is a really important piece. I think there are the skill sets of finance, strategy, but once you're in the room, your capacity to collaborate with others is really important. And there are a couple of things I'll add. I think that the relationship with your CEO and your capacity to engage and encourage and monitor and nurture that relationship is important. And I think the final thing which I usually say is the most important skill of a director is actually courage. And I think it's that capacity to have courage to do the right thing, to understand when to speak, when not to speak, but ultimately understand that really everything stops with you. And if you have the courage to do the right thing, uh, it makes an enormous difference within the organisation. Tricia, because Governance Institute, of course, practices very strongly here and does a lot of work and a lot of programs. That's right. What do you think are the key skills? Well, like our namesake, Governance Institute, I would say one of the key skills is an understanding of governance is absolutely fundamental and would echo Janet's comments regarding the, I think, absolutely basic requirement is a strong understanding of finance and of the strategy and business of the organisation. I'd also add that it's very really important for directors to add value. That's what, why you're there, um, is to try and add value in whatever shape or form in terms of your learnings, to be questioning of management and um, hopefully to also uh, assist them with whatever projects they're working on. Um, at Governance Institute we have a number of courses in relation to foundations of governance or certificate of governance practice or in a not-for-profit governance uh, certificate as well, um, which might be helpful for those of you who are interested in learning more about governance. Okay. Which brings us to the next question because the skill sets that you talked about there were not just technical. We had courage, we had team players, we had all of those things that in fact play more to the mm. attributes. Um, the difference between executive and um, management roles, particularly on boards which don't have large numbers of, of staff, so we're not talking major ASX yes. listed companies here, you can muddle them up a bit in mm. your over-enthusiasm sometimes. Yes. Is that something that you guys see at the Governance Institute? Uh, from time to time, yes, that uh, perhaps board might get too involved in certain um, activities like when we were preparing a new certificate when we changed our name and uh, 
you shouldn't have board members drafting certificates or doing marketing, you should leave that to management. But having said that, on the other hand, uh, recently we started discussing uh, revitalising our digitisation strategy. And as I'm quite a champion of digital, I was one of the first key stakeholders interviewed. There will be a number of other directors interviewed, and I think the director of marketing found our input and values where, that board, where the management is actually seeking our input and trying to get um, guidance from us as to what outside third parties are experiencing and customers expect or members expect from a digital perspective. Um, we're also working on an IT transformation project and I was um, called in last week to meet with our IT consultant just to get a better understanding of the project and also work closely with the CFO so that we can draft the board paper in a manner that hopefully will lead to approval of the project. So again, they're seeking guidance from us. We Obviously it's management's remit to run the project and to draft the paper, but seeking guidance from us as to what information do the board need to make an informed decision. Talking of guidance, how does it work for an organisation like Girl Guides, which of course is naturally smaller? I imagine a very large volunteer group though. A huge challenge and it's really interesting Claire that we've actually changed over the last two years of putting in a new governance framework. Um, one of the most difficult things often with not-for-profits and with a large volunteer base is everyone wants to be involved from the ground up. What we did two years ago is turned around so it truly is a top-down board with a board and committees that provide oversight that can then delegate as you would for any commercial organisation, to the management to do the role. One of the important things, though, with a not-for-profit is it doesn't matter whether you've got volunteer or staff, paid staff, it's still getting around the governance framework and actually what is the best way to run the business. And what we've done in that organisation, and I think it applies for any organisation, is make sure that the board is providing the oversight and that the doing comes from the management. But the board's responsibility on that is to be very clear about roles and responsibilities, very clear about key performance indicators um, or what you're expecting from the executive, the management teams on a deliverable basis and keeping people to those commitments. The other thing that I think is crucial in an organisation like this is use of committees. Because what you actually find, and I think one of the most effective things from a board, is a board does need to be thinking strategy, big picture, overviewing the key decisions. You need a work of a board as well. And that's where effective use of board, delegation of responsibilities, they still can't get into the detail, but they can take hands-on responsibility for a range of projects. And that framework, whether it's a not-for-profit, whether it's a commercial board, I think is really important. Um, and it's very dangerous when you actually turn around and get everyone getting their hands dirty at every step because you lose sight of the big picture and therefore you're not attending to your director's duties and responsibilities. In committees, it's, there's an increasing use of them. Um, it leads to the next question too about in building your skill sets to become a better NED or non-executive director, really you need to be working out how you can serve on at least two or possibly even three committees for each board. Is that something that you've seen grow in your time? Yeah, I, I'm a huge um, supporter of the concept of committees because I think they give the capacity for boards to manage their workload and to give individuals on the board and others the opportunity to use specialist skills that uh, they don't necessarily have the opportunity to at a board level. Um, and in the boards that I've worked on, I've always made sure that I'm on committees where my skill set has the capacity for leadership, so I've chaired committees, um, but also on committees that might have been areas where I need to to do some additional work myself so that in the committee context I have the opportunity to get into a bit more detail and to develop my skill set. And I think that's more appropriate than developing your skill set at a board level um, and I think it's a really helpful way to broaden the work that you've done and the issues that you've dealt with. Mm. Claire, I mean I would say as well with that one of the things as a director is you're forever learning. Yes. Um, the notion that you don't have 
um, any more to learn, I mean, in any part of life. But I think as a director, because the issues are changing, mm. um, digital being yes. a classic, which we've already mentioned, you know, there's probably a lot of people sitting around the um, the table who may not have come up with, an, you know, a life skill set or experience on the digital. But it's something we all need to get our yes. mind around. And I, you know, refer to a comment from David Gonski um, a year ago. He talked of reverse mentoring. He mm. recognised that he actually didn't have the skill set there. So where he was mentoring a young woman within ANZ Bank, yes. he got her to mentor in reverse so that he mm. could come up the learning curve. So things will change. The other thing I think one of the most valuable things in learning skill set is looking around the table at the people around you. One of the things with directorship is experiential learning. Mm -hmm. you, can do all the you can do all the courses and they're essential but it is you are working as a team and one of the things to always be looking at as well as contributing is observing how people are doing things mm. and thinking if that's relevant to your skill set to the way you become a director around the table and thinking about changing and developing. Which speaks to <coughs> excuse me, a question we've got from Elizabeth Valentine, thank you. Um, the levels of capability that you think are evident within boards in general it, in terms of providing oversight for strategy, risk, compliance and value and the digital factor. There's been a bit of a question lately mm. that in fact a lot of boards are not are scrambling a bit on, yes. on that new economy area mm. and how well do you think boards are equipped in general to oversight those areas, particularly the latter one? I think, as Janet has said, the, the reverse mentoring it is an excellent suggestion and that um, digitisation skills is something that, and digital skills is something that all boards and directors are going to need to do some more work on. Um, I think we've seen that recently with, in terms of managing the reputation risk with just on the weekend with Woolworths and uh, I'm not sure if you're aware there was a data breach where they sent out an email to a number of uh, people, I think about a thousand, who had gift cards and it also included the passwords for those gift cards and people's email addresses. So we've got a privacy breach, we've got data protection breach, we've got reputation issues and Woolworths also had the reputation issue not that long ago on Anzac Day mm. which was not really a social issue but became a social media issue because it was discussed um, and was there were a number of people quite passionate about it on Twitter and that it wasn't the appropriate approach. What would have you done? Because that issue really ran. And yes, once it, it started, did. it just really took yes. off. So as a director, how do you get in and think about, OK, we've got to shut this down, yes. we've got to stop this. Um, how do you get in touch with management? What do you do in that, in that context where you can see your reputation yes. streaming out there? How do you think about that? Well, at Governance Institute, we have a PR agency that are available to us and I would hope have a crisis management plan for such thing and a social media plan. We also have a director of marketing, so I guess I would, as president, I would call a meeting pretty quickly, be it teleconference or otherwise, if I couldn't get face to face, to meet with the CEO, the head of marketing and our PR agency and come up with a plan and a strategy of how we're going to address it. And um, if necessary, get the CEO to come out and speak to it and try and shut it down. I think, you know, you have to address it and sometimes if you don't and you just let it snowball, that can be what happens. Leah, because it can happen everywhere. It can happen mm. in a small financial mm. services mm. company. It doesn't have to be a major listed or, or organisation. How do you think about that in terms of risk? Well, I think there are a range of things that can go wrong and I think digital is a, a aspect where it accelerates and increases the exposure. So it's not that it's necessarily a new exposure, but suddenly something that five people might know and be annoyed about, five million people can know about in <laughs> under five seconds. Um, so there's an acceleration there. And I think as a board, you need to actually plan in advance for how you deal with issues mm -hmm. and how your processes work to support the outcome of the organisation. And you need to make sure that you have access to the right skills, not just in your board, but the kind of people who you can get into the room when you need them and in your executive team. So I think a lot of this is if you are caught by surprise by an event and you don't have a crisis management plan, mm. you don't have a risk plan, you don't have a strategy, you don't have every other director's number on your mobile phone saved, that's when you, you cause yourself 
greater stress over something that could be better managed. Any issue that arises can be managed. The question is, how do you have a system in place to do that well? And and that's an interesting one because it speaks to the risk register at the mm. beginning of meetings, all of those kind of things, that sometimes organisations in the haste to move to the business of things overlook some of that sometimes boring process stuff. They do, Claire, and I mean, I, that you need to have that framework and that structure there. Um, and I would say that you ideally don't want to be having to deal with those matters at the beginning of a board meeting, but you need to know that they're there mm. so you can apply them. Um, I mean, I would hope the first part of a board meeting is typically about your higher level yes. stuff strategy and risks. But the one other point I would make in terms of crisis management is leadership and mm. it really comes to the chairman of the board. Mm. Um, I think that this is where you very much are looking for that leadership, you're looking for the trust that is developed. Um, it is up to the chairman to guide both the board as their leader um, uh, and also to guide the management where they're providing the oversight so that you actually can have an effective strategy to know whether this is an issue that you need to deal with immediately or is it white noise? And I think that's mm, one of the most difficult yes. things in scenarios. Now, the, coming back to social media, the pace of that world yes. has picked up so much. Mm. And, you know, that is one thing, whereas I think boards really are learning. I don't think mm. this is an area where, you know, you can say, yes, we've ticked the box, mm. whereas people might say on strategy we've got a range of plans. But I think it comes to the leadership and whoever the leadership of that matter that the boards are going to assign. And just because it's leadership by the chairman, often they won't necessarily be the front person speaking on it. But it needs to be, again, I come back to that team, to that governance, to that leadership. So the three key attributes of a good chair. You've been a chair. I'm pretty sure you're a good one. So <laughs> what are the three key attributes? Number one, I would say trust. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it is important that you have the trust of everyone, all your stakeholders. The second one is to be a strategic listener. So I think listening mm. is really important, um, working out what is white noise or not. And for, for a chairman, probably being the last voice at the table, although sometimes knowing that's not the right time and when to lead it. And the third one is being a good business manager because effective boards are boards that run well. Mm. You know, the basics of board papers, meetings, knowing when issues are. Mm. So being able, not as a very explicit but the r smooth running of the board happens because the chairman has got it under control. So trust, listening, business management skills or being a good business manager, understanding intrinsically the operation of the organisation. Tricia? Um, sort of in that same theme I'd say being a first among equals because not dominating but doing the active listening and you're leading but you really are need to be collegiate and you're working with your peers. Uh, I think integrity is very important and um, we're seeing that come up more to the fore with uh, some recent crises and the like. And um, I think emotional intelligence might be another one that okay. we need to have. Bit of yes. VI. Leah, what do you think? <laughs> okay, well, I, uh, I have a couple of things that I think are important characteristics for chairs. And I think uh, I mentioned courage previously. And someone the other day said that directorship is um, one of the forms of pure leadership. You're rarely doing, but you're actually leading. And I think for a chair, it's that leadership aspect of it that has combinations of integrity and courage. I also think as a chair you have a role in the curation of information. So an enormous amount of information is created about an organisation, the market, and as the chair you need to be able to personally be able to curate all of that and, and have it make sense to you and be able to make sense of it for others. And I think um, the final thing that I think is important is relationships. And as a chair you have a really broad range of relationships including the relationship that you have with all of your staff, which has to have uh, certain characteristics to it, the relationship with your peers around the table and your relationship with your CEO. So, excuse me, I would say they're, they're the three that I would select. Interesting ones. We've actually just had a question which I'm going to take as well from Alyssa. Thank you. And Alyssa asks, certain skill sets are more valued for boards or they appear to be. Uh, I think it's changing, but I'll ask the panel, accounting and law. But I think we're seeing a shift. 
um, to strategic marketing, strategic HR. There's been a big yes. talk about understanding of digital mm. here and ICT, which naturally comes with a younger set yes. of um, people. So what are the more uh, unusual but still valuable skills and background that you think are valuable for board roles? Well, I think definitely um, the marketing and the digital one where I think um, I think about a director recently appointed to the Qantas board. His yes. name escapes me, but isn't he on the television? Tom, Tom thank yes. you. Yes, Tom. Doing all sorts of crazy things and um, clearly that's, a, a, you know, he said he wasn't looking for a directorship, but I think because of his different way of looking at the world and uh, background in advertising that they've seen that that's helpful for a Qantas board to understand that being a consumer business. Um, I think risk is, whilst risk has always been there, it's certainly been increasingly seen as an important skill to have um, and for directors to need to have an understanding that particularly those in the listed space having to comply with the ASX corporate governance principles, principle number seven. Um, but I think any boards and any companies, if we're going to be working towards best practice in governance, should be trying to comply with those principles in any event. Because risk is not just about legal. Risk is about no, reputation. Risk right. is about all those kind of things too, isn't it? And I would agree it's a, it's a core skill set. And mm. the way I look at it, though, is that rather than risk being just a skill set, I think as a director you need to look at everything through a risk management lens. Yes, there is yes. nothing in business that you shouldn't be viewing from a risk perspective. Mm. And that's a, one of the things as a director as opposed to maybe in executive roles is a different way of looking at things um, and risk. that risk mm. management lens is one of the key ones. One of the things I would say though about the skills that there's no doubt on a board you'd need people with your financial expertise. Yes and with the legal mm. expertise. I mean, we've got to be very careful here that we don't think it's all into the new totally age or different ways of doing it. I mean, they are absolutely essential, um, you know, especially on financials. I mean, you mm. can go to the Centro case. I mean, you every individual director must understand um, the financials. But the one other area I would say, as well as digital sort of big data, is international skill set. Mm. Um, the ability to have that skill set around the board Businesses are now global, um, and I think, you know, we are part of a world, but people of that had that uh, international experience, I think, is a really important combination. Mm. And so I suppose at the heart of this skill set question comes to diversity. Yes. And I actually think one of the things we haven't chat chatted about so far is the fact that boards really do need to be diverse. Mm. Mm. And diversity is not just gender. Yes. Um, diversity is geography, it is experience, it is industry, um, and a collective board is one that mm. brings that variety of diversity together. And as I say, I think if you look over the next decade, um, gender is really important, don't get me wrong, um, but I think it is that complete diversity on a board that is going to be part of that skill set, and mm. I think that's one of the differences. We can't just do things the way that you think we've done them before and hope for a different outcome. Mm. It's a truism we all know. It really applies around the board table. Interesting. And I'm going to follow it up and ask Leah, because Elizabeth Valentine has followed up and said, is the current board process of governance by exception, where the board essentially relies on the board papers for their information adding risk, because of course board papers can be 400 pages, 500 pages, 600 pages, do we need a combination of traditional mechanisms and others that are more agile to cope with the speed of disruptive change and risk? So back to your thing about things moving, um, are we going to see a shift in the way we think about the board structure and those board kind of processes? Well, I'll, I will um, get to that because I think that's an interesting issue. I want to just loop back to the skill yep. set for directors and what people are recruiting for at the moment because just to add into what um, Tricia and Janet have said, my experience in the market in the recruitment process with boards at the moment is I think there's an assumption, particularly for commercial boards, that your finance governance skills are expected. Yep. So people don't talk to me about my legal skills, my finance skills, my governance skills in spite of the fact that you know governance is probably the area that I have the strongest skill set in, the areas that people are interested in talking about are the work I've done in digital and technology, 
the work I've done overseas, uh, my work in Indigenous communities, so the multicultural aspect, and increasingly for me the transactional stuff. So having shown leadership in larger transactions, mergers, acquisitions of other businesses, sale of businesses. So I think we need to recognise that the basic skill set of legal and finance, and even risk to some extent, in certain roles, it's expected that you have all mm. of that. So they are not skill sets you bring to the table. Everyone at the table has that skill set, and you are bringing something in addition to that. So I think there's that uh, slight adjustment in what the basics of being a director might be about. On to the question about how boards inform themselves. Um, I think there are a range of challenges around the board paper process that we use at the moment. And most people who are involved in board papers could spend their entire career searching for how do we present the perfect information. And I have this view, which I, I talk to people about all the time, is sort of the one page, just the one mm. page that tells me everything I know so that I know what I then need to focus on. Uh, and I think there are uh, fantastic opportunities with our capacity with technology to provide contemporaneous, relevant, helpful information to boards that can assist them in their decision making. I think the days of a printed, you know, 100 page hard copy being couriered to all of your directors, which was my experience as a company secretary for many years, um, have well and truly gone. Uh, and I think each company, and particularly for company secretaries and for chairs who are curating and managing information for boards, they need to work out the best way to get the information that's relevant for their board to give their board enough time, but also to make the information as up-to-date as possible. Mm. Yes. There's a lot that can be done with um, board portals, yes. with um, digital access, and I think each company mm. needs to work out what works best for it. Are you doing that? We are on some of the boards, others we're not. Um, you know, it is a continuum. One of the important things I think, though, is it comes back to actually understanding and knowing the business that you're in so that you can know what you don't know and also know the times as to when you actually need to make the deep dive. So I, it's very easy for boards to get set into a, um, a regular meeting pattern, committees, it all sort of goes like clockwork. If you've missed the big picture of understanding what issues are, and let's take an example, when regulatory or government change comes through, What's the responsibility? The responsibility of the board is to actually understand the matter, not to necessarily execute it. But so you need to be able to say, what do I need to know? And then have the framework set up, as we talked about at the beginning of the conversation, about knowing what matters do I think management haven't got right and that I need to do the deep dive into. So it's that you know, emotional intelligence you're talking in terms of that understanding as well as the, um, the IQ in terms of knowing what do I not know but you need to have that often informed base mm. and that's where sometimes the boards need to say we want the education as yes. we want to get the mm. knowledge as well as actually just dealing with the mechanics of actually a board meeting mm. or the specific matters at hand. So and you want the backstory. Yeah, and I think directors also, part of the job is you need to take personal responsibility for being up to date in your area, in your market. It's not all about I've received the board pack and that's everything. It's absolutely your responsibility to curate information mm. on your own, to understand the industry, to understand what's going on and to ask those questions of your management team if they've not uh, brought things to your attention. Yeah, it's not just the boardroom yeah. and the board pack. So um, another question came in, and I'm going to defer that. Um, so please, I will get them all answered. Uh, <laughs> I'm interested in that topic because it's really interesting because people think that boards are, you know, just it's the oversight and it's the strategy. You do need to have that big broad market knowledge. You need to be really quite an expert in some areas and it's your responsibility to be keeping yourself up, uh, up to date. Um, and then people just say, well, directors exercise governance. Well, governance is a pretty big term. Yes. What do you understand by the term governance, which is bandied around a whole sure. lot these days? I guess from a personal perspective, Claire, I think it's about what would right-thinking people of the community see as appropriate stewardship in a particular okay. situation. Um, so I guess that's also, you know, what does, what is right. Um, at Governance Institute, we look at the processes, regulations around uh, 
an authority which is exercised and controlled in a particular organisation and we also have um, what we call our four foundations or pillars of governance which are transparency, accountability, integrity and stewardship. Okay, so that's what you see as governance. Do you echo that? Indeed, and I suppose if, if I put another sort of layer to that, I think it is as the framework as the setup that enables the business to run or the organisation. Um, that, has, that starts with the values and the integrity mm -hmm. as you talked about. It then goes to the policies and the principles and it then goes to the processes. So, you know, it's not just a one a simple box to tick, um, but once you've got that overarching framework mm. that a business or organisation can run, then you can have an ability to deal with any particular matters on that basis. So it is the personal, it's the policy, it's the processes, but it's putting it and it's integrating all of those into one package that is relevant for your business, because the other thing is governance, it's not a one-stop mm. uh, one shop. It actually needs to be applied to each individual mm. organisation, and it will be different with each organisation. Mm. Yes? And I think of governance, I guess, broadly as a tool. Um, and I uh, do an analogy to when, when I was younger and fitter and competed in triathlon. Governance for companies good is like... Good for me. I wasn't good. I wasn't fast. Um, but I completed. Uh, the governance for me is like breathing when you're exercising. It's an essential requirement. But depending on whether you're swimming or riding a bike or running, the way you breathe is different. And governance needs to be like that for an organisation. It's like an organisation intaking oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide and you need to work out the most effective way to do that so the organisation achieves its objectives. Governance is not an objective and by itself. It's a tool to achieve the organisation's objectives. I like the analogy. I like it. We've had a couple of questions around um, how you come from, for example, their skill set as a marketing communications professional based in regional Queensland, a very fine place <laughs> to be based, I have to point out. Um, mm. And um, how do you break into a board role or into a committee or board role? Mm. Um, Queens, I think that that could apply generally for mm. people living in regional areas. And, of course, government boards are quite often ones that people um, first look to because they have to have a proportion of people from those areas. And that leads me to the second area where someone was talking about how, if you're on a government board, how do you sit on a commercial board? Can you sit on a mm. commercial board? And if you're on a commercial board, how do you sit on a government board? So there's quite a lot of questions around how you move and where you mm. sit. Do you think it is just about skill sets? Um, does geography come into play? Is it harder to get known as a marketing professional living in Emerald or somewhere like that? Well, it's interesting, Claire. Uh, the new Premier, Anna, I can't say her last name. Oh, Shane. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> in Queensland just announced last week, I yeah. believe, that she wants 50% of women on government boards, yes. oh, sorry, 50% of members of boards to be women, a substantial increase from the current 31%. So perhaps being in regional Queensland is the right time right now <laughs> yes. to start your board journey. Yeah. Um, and regional, I guess I'll probably defer to Leah to talk about whether there are opportunities, particularly in Indigenous boards, that perhaps you And you've you been on a rural GP those. board too, haven't you? I am currently on a rural GP uh -huh. board, yes, indeed. I, I mean, I've always had, a, I guess, a rural and regional focus in the work that I do because I grew up in the country yes. and I think there are particular attributes of people who've grown up on a property and I think there are some real strengths in that that you can bring to a board. <laughs> Go you country girls. Yes. <laughs> and I also think that um, there are a range of opportunities in regional Australia um, in a whole raft of areas. There's state government, there's federal government, there's local government. Um, there are a range of local tourism associations industry associations. Um, I could think of, you know, probably 10 different opportunities if you're regionally based. And also there are opportunities beyond that where your location is not the most important thing. I, I've travelled to a, a large number of places um, for board roles that I've been on. And the key aspect is not where you are, but the value that you can bring and the match that you have. In the recruitment process, there are some aspects around hard skills that we've talked about, 
but there are also aspects around your experience and what you bring to the room and having a, a regional, rural, remote experience brings a different characterisation to what you can add in the room. It's part of the diversity. It is, and I, I think one of the key things there is that you'll end up on boards where you've got the heart, where you've got a genuine interest. So talking about this transition from a rural or a not-for-profit to government to commercial, um, there's no easy path and it's not as though one is going to lead to mm. the other. Mm. Um, there's a bit of this notion, I think, that if you do a regional or rural, somehow we're all going to emerge on ASX 100 boards. The reality is that's not, not going... Not enough spaces. There's not <laughs> enough spaces. That's not going to happen, you know, Number one, make sure as to what your objective is going to be. But the other thing is there is a need to do time and get involved. Um, this notion that um, the world is right for as many people who want to be company directors, it's hard yards. Mm. Let's, you know, not delude ourselves to yes. think that it's an easy path. People need to be patient. Yes. You need to do your time and build your skill set. Mm -hmm. And that's where getting something, whether if it's in a rural area, whether if it's a not-for-profit or whatever of the government, it will take time build and learn. That will create the opportunities, that will get you known in a variety of different areas. But I would sit back on this and say, what do you really want yes. as a director? Um, directorships come in a huge variety of different sizes, mm. shapes and objectives. I think it's most important that whatever you do, you're doing it from the heart. You've got to be able to make the contribution. Um, it isn't a one, an easy path to go. You will create that yourself, but be prepared to put in. It is no different to an executive career. It's like making a career jump in an executive yes. world, making a career jump from exec to non-exec. It's and hard also, work. Yeah, also, and, and Janet and I have talked about this before, if you take the view that you're going to be on some regional and remote board and, you know, slog it out for a couple of years and then make it to ASX 100, you could end up doing more damage than good because if that's your intention, your capacity to assist that board might be limited. limited. And particularly with Indigenous organisations, if you think sitting on an Indigenous organisation board for a couple of years is going to lead to career opportunities, you actually will be doing yourself and the community an enormous disservice and so I think people need to be honest with themselves about their career objectives but if you're planning to be on a not-for-profit board, a regional remote board, an indigenous board, um, you need to be doing that because you've got a heart for it and you want to make a difference. My indigenous community boards, I wanted to make a difference. I was there because I wanted to close the gap, improve indigenous health and I wasn't there thinking if I do this I'll end up on an ASX 100 board and people can tell what your true motivation is. So mm. separate the heart and the commerce and if you need to and don't think about your career as using not-for-profits to get a financial outcome mm. in the end. And, and of course we've so. always got the teleconferencing option, don't we? You don't That's have to right. rush off to board meetings all over it's the like country. like we are now, but uh, with the not-for-profits I think also that there are a number that are very large not-for-profits and I think we talked about this at a Women on Boards event that there is almost this label that if yeah. you get the not-for-profit board first then you can use that as a stepping stone. Well there may well be that a not-for-profit board like a World Vision or something is so large that actually that might be the destination for some time and as you say you don't want to, you want to contribute as much as you can and not have this uh, using it as a stepping stone sort of approach. But, yeah. I think that's an interesting point because a lot of people ask that and yes. there is sometimes people saying you shouldn't do a not-for-profit mm. board because it will somehow damage yes. you. Well, so you'll get labelled as you know, a not-for-profit. There's a lot yes. of quality not-for-profits mm. out there. There's a large number of health funds, um, a large number of organisations, a lot of the university mm. sector. There's in fact some enormous organisations yes. that come under the banner mm. of not-for-profit. David Gonski is particularly passionate about them Many ASX directors, in fact, all have a good have a not for profit. I guess the difference is, is people often think about it as community boards versus the larger not for profit yes. sector, where they're often running housing associations mm -hmm. and, and those an sorts of things. Thing there is to think of maybe as a step as not for profit, profit for members, and that's a <laughs> you know the whole mutual sector. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where the, the superannuation funds sit, where the credit unions, permanent mm -hmm. building societies. I mean, in, in, to a range of insur um, insurance companies, and again, it's 
there is a need to actually make a profit in those business, but it's, is it at the same as a commercial level? So mm. each of these are valid strategies. Yes. Just the que what I would say is question yourself, where are you wanting to position yourself for a period of time? It's more about mm. the skill set and mm. experience rather than necessarily thinking there is a pathway or a journey. It's you've got to work out what your outcome is. Because industry bodies um, fit into that yes. area and yet are very large, have mm. significant turnovers and manage quite complex businesses. Yes, we have over 7,000 members, you know, we have a significant revenue, we have serious business of three streams of education, membership and training and professional development. We're Australia-wide, we've got offices in each state. So, you know, it's not a straightforward business and we try to run it like an ASX-listed business. You would hope that the Governance Institute has good governance <laughs> and uh, we publish an annual report every year, which some not-for-profits don't. They might do a shorter annual review or just an information statement. So I would say that if you, it is definitely an opportunity in not-for-profits, but to go back to Janet's point about having a pathway and having a strategy, I think for all uh, aspirational directors or anyone in a director journey, it's very important to sit back and have a strategy and say, well, what is my desire in my directorship journey? Where would I like to go? What, what areas interest me? What companies do I think I can contribute to? Or, or what regions or what types of areas, uh, like Leah mentioned, rather than just, oh, I just got to get on a board. And it kind of it seems to be quite fashionable at the moment that, oh, I want to be a director. And I think that goes to, do you th really understand what the potential liabilities are or risks as well as the rewards? It can be extremely rewarding, but you need to be remembering about joint and several liability and the like. Which brings me to the next question, because we now have the magnificent Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission, which the government has retained, and Women on Boards is a very strong supporter of the ACNC. Um, it has found that um, clarity around good governance is not really permeating the sector, and more importantly, that some of these issues, a quarter of the concerns raised, were in fact by charities that had revenues of more than $1 million. And so sometimes there can be some questions around compliance and around governance in the not-for-profit sector. Why do you think that is? I think one of the interesting points about the complaints in the ACNC report is that while there were a high percentage that relate to organisations that were larger, if we think about the data on the touch points of larger not-for-profits, I think that may explain some of that. So, for example, Mission Australia uh, interacts with an enormous number of Australians. It's a very well-known name, um, so therefore people notice it and are more likely to comment on the work that it does. If I ran a charity out of the, uh, the, my home where I just collected money and, and bought myself fabulous clothes, it may not interact with many people and I may get fewer complaints, but what I'm doing is actually appalling. I'm not really doing that, obviously. It's an example. Um, but I think the situation that we have in the not-for-profit space is it's evolving. Mm. And we have people who are on not-for-profit boards who are often in environments where they're very resource constrained and they're doing the best they can and they need some guidance and some help. Mm. And um, I think the environment will improve significantly. I think we're on a pathway. And I think if we look back at listed companies in the early 90s, I think we're on a similar pathway. Mm. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? I would in that if you think about when the ASX corporate governance principles were introduced back in 2003 and you look at how far we've come, yeah. we're now mm. up to the third edition and I think the level of governance and the level of uh, um, quality of reporting and the quality of um, ASX listed companies and what is expected by the community has risen you know, exponentially. And I think the ACNC is wonderful in that it's kind of starting that journey now with not-for-profits by introducing these seven governance standards, um, having them report against them, having the first report come out. It, it's really, as Leah has said, it's the beginning of the journey. And whilst it is a bit concerning what's come out of the report, I wasn't that surprised about it in that you know, a number of not-for-profits uh, directors, they're not remunerated, they're doing it, it's because they're passionate about the, the mission of the organisation or the cause, 
and they might not have a background where they've ever had any governance or even an understanding of administrative functions, risk or finance or legal. So they're, I guess they're eager amateurs, if you like, and perhaps part of the great work that ACNC does is that it has illuminated these issues but also gives them direction in terms of, well, perhaps you could do some training in this regard or um, gives them guidance. There are, uh, we also offer guidance in terms of good governance guidance, which are freely available on our website. Um, so there's lots of tools, and I guess it's, it's about the education process, and um, this is why it's important that the ACNC is retained. Um, you're a chair um, of a not-profit, and does it take as much time as being on Whitehall Capital, for example? <laughs> does it does. Right take as much time? It does. Um, I mean, I, I chair, the, I'm treasurer there and chair the finance committee, not chairman of the board. It does take the time. It probably takes more time, yeah. which is mm. why you're probably doing it from the heart. Yes. Part of it is also taking it on the journey. And I think one of the challenges that has come out of the, the most recent ACNC report, um, and, you know, circling back to comments earlier about um, working with volunteers and paid staff is I think there's a realisation in a lot of not-for-profits that not everyone is going to have the right role by being sitting on the board. Um, one of the things that we're seeing, as you alluded mm. to, there's a learning journey and an education, but it's not for everyone. Yes. And I think one of the most difficult challenges you're going to mm. find for a number of not-for-profits is actually working out how do we best harness the opportunities of the volunteers, mm. how do we maybe work with some people who aren't understanding skill, director skills, maybe don't get that, to say there are a variety of different ways that we can use those yeah. skill set and volunteers. Um, because it is, not everyone can come up that learning curve, because a lot of people have come to the table because of what they've done in the organisation, as opposed yes. to actually understanding those directors' responsibilities, yeah. financial responsibilities. Those things still sit there whether you're a director mm. of a not-for-profit, mm. whether it's a government board, whether you're a commercial board. Yes. And, you know, that's, I think, a bit of a light bulb that probably a number of not-for-profits, a number of organisations mm. haven't... Ne well, the organisations may have, but whether it's come down to all the people sitting around the table, yes. I'm not sure. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges mm. Mm. for not-for-profits probably over the next year yeah. or so. And I think that goes back to the point about a chair having quiet words say to certain individuals and also succession planning and board composition generally which we haven't really had a chance to talk that much about but that oh you're smiling Claire. <laughs> I was just saying, Carl's just asked us how do you get rid of a non-profit? Oh okay. Oh, what a diplomatic way of saying it. So, yes, so actually it's a 10 step process. So yes how do you get rid of the non-performing board member? Yes. Panel. <laughs> well I think you probably have a quiet word that um, the them the aside, a fireside yeah. chat or something like that might be a nice way to start. But it is sometimes challenging if somebody doesn't want to leave and they've got the right to stay. Um, what do we do? You know that, and that can be very that, hard on not profits right. where they're often founded mm. it and things as well. Mm. And look, I think that again comes to your governance framework at the beginning. Yes. It talks about setting quite clearly. What the, bar, mm. what, what the bar is, what are the expectations of directors, what's the requirement. There is no reason why not-for-profits are any different That's from right. doing performance mm. reviews. Yes. I mean, there needs to be that framework of continual review, assessment. It may be, if things have changed, finding other opportunities yes. or roles, but it does to coming to have the mm. honest conversation. Mm. You know, and in that sense, it's no different to a range of other roles. If people are there by virtue, mm. though, of an election process yes. um, or a nomination process, then you may be constrained. Yes. But that's to then, I would say, the chair mm. finding the right role for that person so that they can contribute in the way they think and not be a constraint mm. on the overall board performance. Which speaks to terms for directors, which in fact was mm. raised in the last revision of the corporate governance um, principles and recommendations. And quite often a lot of boards don't have any terms mm. and you suddenly turn around and find someone who's identified with that organisation yes. and they've been there 20 and 25 years. So what are your thoughts on terms? I think uh, 
we need to be flexible around the issue on term limits. Um, I think there are some extreme examples. I was asked if I would assist an organisation and the chair had been chair of that organisation longer than I've been alive. Um, so I felt that was a long uh, term appointment. But, um, and, you know, there are some challenges that go with that. And I think, you know, when we talk about underperforming directors, I like to think about when you're starting the journey, you need to talk with the end in mind. So in appointing directors, we need to talk about, you know, what is the time frame we expect you to be on this board? It is not forever. It's rare that there is a board that anyone should be on forever and have honest conversations about, we'd like you to contribute for between five to nine years and then we would like you to open up the opportunity for others to contribute. Mm. And I think that conversation in an ongoing way is important. I think on term limits, you need to balance out the requirement for retaining some knowledge around the organisation and the history in the room, but also getting fresh eyes and fresh thoughts. And that balance is just about a good succession planning model. You may lose directors that you weren't planning to lose, and you need to be flexible around how you have the right skill set, the right history. Um, there is no formula that is perfect. My view is if you have been on a board for six years, you should probably be thinking about your exit strategy and how you will ensure that the board and the organisation will be well served by someone who can replace. Um, on one of my boards, I've brought someone on who will be a replacement for me in two years' time, and I'm hoping two years will be an apprenticeship period that will allow them to then show leadership. Uh, and I think if you are, have been on a board for nine years, you need to start thinking about whether you could add more value elsewhere. Yeah. And Claire, one of the challenges, I think, and especially in some of the not-for-profit sector, is at the other end of the spectrum. People have terms for one year or so, yeah. mm. and that can be yes, equally very disruptive. Um, as constraining mm. on the growth of the business. So I think your point on terms needs to be looked at in terms of holistically what the business mm. um, can be about. And a, you know, a comment that I would make to people thinking of going on the director journey, it is a commitment when you take on a directorship. Um, mm. This is not one where you can go, look, this is the right one for me now. I've got a better opportunity in six or 12 months' time. I mean, it is one thing about choose carefully um, because you need to be able to make an ongoing commitment. So I think organisations need to have that right combination of terms um, and length of terms, but individuals need to have that mindset as well because it goes to your integrity mm. as a director. Yes. Um, and it is the one where circumstances will change, but people need to make the commitment, the mm. organisation needs to make the commitment. So mm. I think we've got both ends of the spectrum yes. at the moment. Excellent. I'm just going to go to the questions. One from Mary, who asked about monetary and non-monetary rewards from being a director. That is a very uh, <laughs> long and involved answer. Um, our getting started, in fact, looks at that issue. The short answer is, is there is no definite answer. Some of them are fixed salaries. Some of them are per diem. Uh, depends on whether it's government. Some not-for-profits pay. Some pay the chair of the Audit and Finance Committee and don't pay the directors. Some reward them in other ways. Sports bodies, for example, will often send you to where the team is competing. So it's a long um, answer, but the big thing that you should do is ask how directors are um, compensated, how they um, service their directors in terms of looking after directors. Okay, Some organisations will send directors on training and those sorts of things. So I'm going to short circuit that one by answering it. But um, <laughs> Rebecca Ramsey asks, and I'm going to ask you for a quick comment, what about if you're in an organisation? Is it common to shift from being an executive director to a non-executive within the same organisation? Now, I would argue that probably only on subsidiaries, mm. perhaps, um, would that happen or on private companies? And it's more common in Europe than it is here, wouldn't yes. you say? Yes, yeah? I would agree with that. Yeah. And I think um, it's interesting, actually, I think when that does happen in listed companies, sometimes people agitate for change. In fact, that has happened with Karoon Gas, where there's been some shareholder activism, where they've said we've got the family too involved still, has been the argument. They haven't been successful, but they've said it's probably not appropriate to have the CEO be the son of the chair and the kind of movement from executive director to being also a director on the board. So Independence I, is important. Yes, is that's what right. You're Independence here. is very important. So I think it's quite unusual to move within one organisation. It'd have to be the passage of time. Well, I think recently there's been some calls for Roger Corbett to come back to be um, 
on the board of Woolworths after being CEO or something like that and um, that there was some concern about had enough time been passed. So there are exceptions um, but I think the independence argument is... Wins out. Would you both agree with that? I'd agree. I mean the key thing is what are the roles of each of those. If you've got the ability to have the transition you probably need a passage of time. Um, it's not a one shot stop on the whole thing but I would suggest it's a hard transition. Um, private companies are the interesting one. Yep. I think it's a really difficult transition for most people from an executive role to a board role. It is a really different skill set, it's a really different interaction and I think for people sometimes separating from where you have worked as an executive will serve you better in developing a new skill set. Okay I'm going to ask everybody just to sum up now on balance do the rewards of being a director outweigh the risks and responsibilities and would you recommend directorship to others? Tricia. Um, I certainly think that the rewards do outweigh the risks. I think it's an incredible experience uh, working with amazing people and learning about organisations. Um, you just have to be doing it for the right reasons which I think we've talked about quite a bit. Absolutely but it's about choosing your portfolio and what your personal objectives are. It's not the rest of the world's objectives. If it's right for you, I would go for it. I have. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree. I mean, I love being a director and I think that the rewards definitely outweigh the risks, but I think, like most aspects of risks, the more you understand the risks and the more you know how you are meeting expectations, um, the more you will feel the reward. So if you think... If you understand what is required and you can do a great job of it, then the rewards are awesome. Thank you. And um, I know you can't applaud, but I'm sure you all are. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to thank the panel of Tricia Mock, Janet Tawney and Leah Fricky on your behalves. Um, the transcript from this webcast will be available afterwards. I noticed that one or two of you were having difficulties in accessing it, so please don't worry. You will be able to see us all again. Those of you wanting to watch us all again, of course, can, and you will be <laughs> receiving some follow-up communication too. I'd just like to particularly thank Redback Conferencing for the opportunity. I'd like to thank Governance Institute of Australia and, of course, our own organisation, Women on Boards, for making this available to you. So I wish you all a good afternoon and thank you very much for attending.